dark side. Two, one, zero. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Play Expo in Blackpool. Sunday afternoon. I'm Dan Wood, and uh, this is Rafi Ever. We host uh, the UK's biggest weekly retro gaming podcast, The Retro Hour. Now, the way our show works is every week we get on a veteran of the video game industry to talk about their experiences and um, kind of their history and what's inspired them. And here at Play Expo, we're hosting these live that will be broadcasting our podcast very soon. But today, he needs no introduction. Please give a warm welcome to the legend that is Jeff Minter. Do you have a little presentation you'd like to play first? Uh, yeah, it's just a little thing about uh, what we're showing here today. Um, we've got a thing called uh, Monitor Arcade, and it ties back into something which actually started live here in Blackpool. Um, back in, I think it must have been 2010, I was invited to come down to one of the, fir the first play expos here, and um, I brought with me a little iPhone game I'd done called Monitor Rescue. And uh, demonstrated it in a little room over in the corner there, and it, it, it actually went down very well. Uh, it was an iOS, and uh, that's the game. And um, it inspired me to go on and, and create a series of games which I called the Minotaur Project on iOS. And there are various of them here which I'll just run, run through. This was Minotron 2112, which is basically the iOS version of Lamatron. I don't know if any of you remember Lamatron. <laughs> Uh, this was Caverns of Minos, which in, in incorporated elements of Thrust, Lunar Lander, and Caverns of Mars. I don't know if you remember Caverns of Mars on the Ego Atari, a very fine game. Uh, Five a Day was inspired by Time Pilot, and um, featured very sort of weird, chilled out, new agey sound effects. Super Ox Wars was uh, inspired by Star Force, of course, and also inspired by the Amazonian Ox Dance Festival which takes place in, you know, up the Amazon in Brazil. You have to travel to Manaus and then go 24 hours by boat to an inaccessible island where this takes place. And I'm hoping to actually go there next year. And then Goat Up, which is a little platform game, actually the first platform game that the Larmsoft ever did. Somehow back in the day, I never got around to doing platform games. And Grid Runner, I don't suppose that needs too much of an introduction. And generally these games were well liked, but uh, there were various problems. I mean, the reviews were all pretty good. The user ratings on the App Store were like 4.5 or higher. Uh, we managed to actually make touch controls that didn't completely suck, which uh, is a rarity even in these days. Uh, I really enjoyed doing these little games. I enjoyed doing, you know, after having spent a year doing a game, it's nice, it was nice to do games that take you know, a month or two each to make. You could go through a lot of ideas and explore different things and not feel too bogged down. Uh, I like trying uh, different styles that I've never done. I've never done a vertical style, I've never done a platformer, so it's nice to have a look at those classic games. Um, and the, you know, the, the iPad and iPhone hardware actually is pretty capable for this sprite and tile type of stuff. It was you know, a pleasure to work with, really. But the problem was, we only made about 50p. <laughs> um, the thing with iOS is it's, it's not really viable for us because uh, I mean, people generally think if you want to charge two quid for a game, it's expensive. They expect games to either be like 69p or well, these days they expect them to be free. Um, and I, I, I've got no desire to go into the whole free to play thing where basically you try and get people to repeatedly pay. I feel that it alters the way in which games are designed. The game becomes a design exercise in getting people to go through paywalls rather than just to present the complete game as a finished entity, which is what I, I feel I like to do. Uh, so we moved on to different and better things, uh, some of which you may recognise there. And, um, but with all this going on, all these ports to, uh, to PC, uh, TXK was trans transformed into Tempest 4000 and ported to PC and Xbox One. Uh, most of that work fell to Giles, because Giles maintains our, our engine. You know, and I always say he does all the clever stuff. Uh, I won't say he, basically, he, he builds the horse and I get to ride it. Uh, but, so Giles is very busy, but I didn't want to be idle. Uh, I couldn't really 
I'll help out as much as I can with, with the porting, but really that, 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 that's, that's his bailiwick, so he, he gets on with that. I wanted something else to do while, I was, while he was doing that. Um, so I had this idea, also yeah, around this time out, because I've been all the old iOS games, and one of, all my, all the, one of the arcade games fell off the app store. Um, and I got moaned out quite a bit by people who like the games, and they were naturally upset to lose them when they upgraded their iOS. So, I thought it'd be nice not to waste these games and um, yeah, straight porting them to uh, the PC and consoles. I don't think would be, I didn't think would be good enough. Um, but I thought these games were all sprite and tile based, so perhaps it would be quite nice to make an environment where, where you could port these games and make them look nice, look more interesting than they were on iOS, and make them work both in and out of VR. Because having worked in VR now. I think everything we do moving forward, I want to be. They want. To, you know, I want them to be working in VR as well as out of VR. And so I created this thing called the Monitor, Monitor Arcade Environment. It's built on top of our existing engine, the Mirror Engine. And it's voxel based. Every pixel you see on the screen when you play those games is actually a voxel. It's actually a little cube. It's all geometry. And I wanted it to be easy to take the monitor project stuff and get it running really quickly, but versatile enough to allow us to extend the games and make them more interesting than we're on, on, on the iPhone and iOS. Um, it should look cool in and out of the art. And so we, I did two games as a proof of concept. Uh, this shows the iOS original there, Grid Runner, and then the monitor arcade environment port there. You can see there's a lot more going on in terms of uh, deforming the geometry and having <coughs> even more Eugene Jarvis style Robotron explosions. May his name be totally praised. <laughs> and here then is the iOS original of, uh, of GoTup, and here's the Monitor Arcade Environment port. You see we've actually managed to make it look uh, uh, more like Nebulous. <laughs> uh, the little example of, uh, of how the porting goes, that's the original on the left. On day one, that's kind of what I had going. Day two, I started to have some gameplay working. Within one week, you can actually get uh, pretty much the whole iOS game ported over and looking quite, you know, quite, uh, quite different and quite uh, much nicer. Um, I, also, I really don't want to sell games at mobile prices anymore. I can't afford to, to make games at 69p. I mean, you just can't do it. Um, so in order to be able to create a package for PC and consoles, that would contain decent value. Um, so rather than selling individual games, I thought it'd be quite nice to put two games together as, uh, as packages, plus their VR variants. Uh, so you know, we could sell that for under a tenner, and I think people would, would, uh, would actually enjoy that. Um, and they should support VR at the moment, so it's just PS4 and PC for now. And at the moment, it's only Optus, and that's probably the other one. We don't have any hard kit or any uh, Microsoft Mixed Reality stuff yet, but we will have support for those as and when we get them. Um, and the Xbox isn't out of the question since the Neo Engine is actually working on the Xbox. Since we did 10S4000, John ported the Neo Engine to Xbox, so theoretically we could move this stuff over to Xbox pretty quickly. Um, and we're, we're, we're doing volume one for now, and if we do more volumes, depends on how this goes, really. Um, so if it does okay, well, there'll be further volumes. If you can't nice to do. Uh, yeah, obviously, if we make 50p again, then we won't bother we'll just do something else. Um, and potentially, it's not just the monitor project games we could do with this, because it's all sprite and tile based stuff. Then that would cover a lot of Commodore 64 stuff, it would cover, cover a lot of classic uh, era arcade games, and I think you could make those look pretty interesting on, in this environment. Um, I wouldn't like to just do remakes, I don't want to get stuck doing endless versions of the old Commodore 64 games, although it would be nice to do a few of those. It would be nice to use this environment to build some, some entirely new things or to build some sequels to, uh, to existing games. Yeah. And Citadel comes to mind, actually. Um, and so, yeah, come and try Monitor Arcade Volume 1. We've got it in the, uh, we're actually not in the main hall, we're in the uh, dealer's hall off to the side. But you come over and have a go, you can play on a big monitor, you can play. 144 hertz on PC in and out of VR. Come and give it a go. Uh, that's it, really. Come and try our stuff. Yeah. Yeah.
good though, isn't it? Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. Well, Jeff, let's go all the way back to like day one. I mean, what kind of initially got you into games and computers? Um, really, uh, I mean, the first time I ever played a video game, I suppose, was when my brother brought home a Pinotone, one of those Pinotone, you know, the bright orange Pong machines. He brought one of those back, and we played that on the telly. And of course, I went to uh, the local fun fair when it came, and they had Space Invaders in there, and I'd heard the news about this game called Space Invaders that was uh, that was eating up all the coins in Japan. Um, and so I got into playing that. I was still in my first ever game. I scored 470 points. I still remember my score. <laughs> um, but at that stage, I mean, there was no idea of this being anything that, that you could do yourself. There were just things that were manufactured somehow, elves made them or something. And um, I enjoyed them, but you know, it didn't, didn't cross my mind that it could be anything that I could do. Uh, then one day I was in sixth form college and I happened to go into the wrong room and there was a guy sat in front of this thing which looked like a weird calculator typewriter with a, uh, a black and white portable telly stuck on top and he was recognising me playing a game and uh, I don't know, I don't know but how does that work? How do you get to play video games on this thing? And he said, oh, so I typed it in. Uh, at, that moment, at that moment my life changed, I think. It was like, what, you can... You can type stuff into that thing and it makes games. How the hell do you do that? And he said, well, there's this language called BASIC. And you learn this language called BASIC and then you can make the computer do stuff. And so I went to the, immediately to the Sixth Form College Library and found a book on BASIC and got it out, took it home that night. And my brother at the time was working at the AA in Basingstoke and he had a, one of these TI, fancy TI programmable calculators. And he had a little uh, book of programs for that thing. And I had this book on BASIC, and I hadn't probably read either of these things before. I sat down and studied both, and kind of, kind of worked out what I thought would be a working bio of the program, um, which I wrote down in bio on paper, and I went into college early the next morning, and I uh, typed it in, and it didn't work. Uh, but then the guy who I'd seen the day before came in, and he helped me out and showed me what I was doing wrong, and we got this thing working. And that was the start of it really. Then we, you know, I, I learned a bit more coding, you know, I learned enough to start moving things around on the screen, and there were like three or four other guys who were interested, and we all started making little games for each other. And this was back in 1979. Were there any kind of were there any essential books or any kind of resources that you found that you can live without? Um, well, back then, I didn't really have a lot of documentation at all. The Commodore Pet we had in Sixth Form College, I mean, if it had any documentation, I didn't know where it was. Um, so we were just, I was just working for the generic basic book. It wasn't specific to Commodore Basic, and we kind of found, it, found out a lot of stuff by experimentation. I, mean, I, I, kind, of, uh, I kind of worked out that, that screen memory must exist somewhere, and I found it just by poking and peeking randomly around until I made characters appear on the screen. Oh, there it is. <laughs> But you did um, titles for the ZX80 as well. Was that the first machine you personally owned? Yeah, I mean, when the, when the ZX80 was announced, because I mean, the Commodore Pet at the time cost about six or seven hundred quid, um, I, by then I was hopelessly addicted to, to programming. I was spending every, I'd go to college early and spend you know, an hour before college started programming. I'd stay late until the computers kicked me out. I desperately wanted a machine of my own, but I couldn't afford anything. And then Uncle Clive announced his ZX80, and I thought, oh, well, actually, something, something I could possibly save up and buy, only 100 quid. And um, eventually, I did manage to save up, and I, uh, my ZX80 actually arrived on the same day as my A level results. And uh, one of those things had more influence on my life than the other. <laughs> so, what was the uh, first title you started working on? Um, well, I did a bunch of, of, of little games. I did, I, I, did the, the, I guess the first one which anyone would recognise me uh, was a version of Deflex. Uh, I did that for like, the 1K ZX80, the 1K ZX81, and went up to one of the ZX micro fairs. I had a handful of digital games and uh, got chatting to the guy on the DK Tronic stand where they had those sort of memory expansions and keyboards and um, showed him these little games. Like, I did, and he said, oh, you know, do you want the 16K RAM pack? And I said, well, yeah, but I can't afford one. He said, oh, no, have one, and go on there and make some games, and, and, and he'd sell the games. And I came back from there, absolutely gosmack, and I could get 50 quids worth of hardware just by talking to this guy and showing a few games. It's like, hey, maybe this is worth pursuing. 
Did you, your mum help you with publishing these early games? Oh yeah, my mum helped out a lot because I, you know, I, 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 I'll be the first to admit I have a business head on my shoulders, and my mum, you know, a long life had worked on various, you know, worked with various business people and worked as a secretary and, worked, and knew a lot of the ins and outs and how all that worked. So I mean, my family in general were extremely supportive. My mum and dad, I mean, none of this would have taken place without uh, my mum and dad helping out hugely, leaving me just to get on with the coding. So uh, you mentioned Space Invaders. Are we also a fan of Defender and oh, all these classic titles? Oh, I am Defender. Defender was, it was just, it was another one of the revelation points in my life. I can remember where I was, I'd be down to visit my grand, I was on Southampton Common, and there was a, a travelling fun fair at Southampton Common, and they had an arcade tent. And I walked, walked up to the arcade tent, and there was this one gate to one side, outside the entrance, it, was, it must have been new then, they had it outside because they were showing it off, and there was a one lap play, and I started watching the play. And just the explosions blew me away. The fact, well, yeah, Ar arcade game explosions up to that point had just been like a little like zap sprite, like in space in ways. This thing, when you shoot things, bits were flying all over the screen, and when you die, there's this massive cloud of explosion hits. And I was like, wow, what the hell is that? And so, as soon as he finished playing, I had to have a go. And of course, defender being defender, it kicked my ass most severely. But then I got into the sound effects and the explosions, and even though I was losing 10p after 10p, I was enjoying every minute. And I walked away from there like an hour later, skint, walked back to my grand's place, and I was just thinking, that was brilliant. I hope one day I can design games as good as that, because that was amazing. I didn't know at the time, but of course, it was Eugene Jarvis, and um, his games went on to become probably the major influence on my own game design style. This stuff is excellent. And, He's my hero to the state. Well, he did kind of your own version of Defender for the Big 20, didn't he? Yes, it was rubbish. <laughs> uh, it had like, a spaceship the size of a bus, it had chunky character scrolling, it had bugs. It, uh, it, it, amazingly enough, it did, it did quite well. It even got uh, turned into a cartridge and sold in America, but it was a bit rubbish. Uh, you were also using CompuNet quite early on, weren't you? And uh, were you on BBS as well? Um, I wasn't really on BBS that much, but CompuNet I was on all the time. Uh, when they were first set, set, setting it up, I remember the, the organiser, I remember Nick Green, I think, one of the guys behind it. Um, actually, it's quite memorable. I remember, <laughs> I remember going around this place in London, and we had to have a chat about it. And uh, she just walked through the door and said, Hi, Jeff, how are you doing? We're about to turn on with some really amazing hash oil. Do you want some? Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 the other nice chat, I left his place completely blasted. <laughs> uh, but no, Cobby was great. Uh, we spent many, many hours, like, always, you know, like lasting at night, uh, you go to the pub, come back from the pub, get on Cobby Net, stay on Cobby Net, close at about like, two or three in the morning, I can't remember. And there was quite a little community on there of people, and we'd send each other little demos and graphics and, and, and chats and stuff. It was really good. It really felt like a close-knit community then, that kind of pre-internet era. Yeah, it was. It was nice to be able to hook up with people who were all over the country. I mean, you know, also other famous names were coming up, like Tony Crown would be on there. You know, some of the uh, you know, faces from the business would be on there. So, yeah, it was, it was nice. It was you know, a bit like the internet, said, a bit like the net before the net, really. I think it's fair to say you've got a bit of a, a llama fetish. <laughs> <laughs> Where did that all start then? Oh, God, I mean, I just... Actually, I mean, I did, I, when I was at school, I always had a thing for being into camels. I love camels because they're just such weird creatures. And, um, I, I, was, I was known for my love of camels when I, when, even when I was just in secondary school. And I was, I, I, I'd never really heard of the South American camels. And I think there was a Time Life book my mum had about South America. And there were some illustrations in there, there's a picture of a llama. I thought, oh, that looks even weirder than camels. It was a really nice looking weird beast. And so that was kind of in my mind. And um, one day I'd been working on some Vic 20 stuff, and I was just sat at home. I'd, 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 I'd made a little character editor, I could put together multiple characters and make little logos. And I was doodling in there, and I doodled a llama. And then underneath I just doodled llama soft. Ah, <laughs> why not? <laughs> Is that where llama soft started then? Is that yeah, that, that, well, that was the inception point of llama soft. But at that point I'd been publishing some games through other people and um, had uh, not necessarily had the best experience. And so there were a few sharks around and those studies. 
And so I've been inclined towards the idea of uh, breaking off and doing, doing stuff on my own anyway. I hadn't really thought of a corporate identity. Um, so yeah, that, that was the, the, the point at which Lamasoft came to be. Well, how did you go about kind of planning a game and uh, why did you decide to make a game? Did you get an inspiration from something or was it just a fresh idea? Or... Uh, I mean, sometimes obviously I'm inspired by other games. If you look at half the stuff I did for the Monolith Project, then you know, inspired by Star Wars, inspired by this, inspired by that. I mean, there are certain games I like which make me feel a, a certain way and I want to see if I can, can you know, construct something that makes me feel like that or maybe even better. Um, these days, it's all about a feeling. I want to put people into what they call the zone. There's a place I like to be when I'm playing a game where you feel really comfortable and you're settled in and it can feel like the world's exploding all around you but it's actually quite chilled out and nice. And I want to take people to that space, and I want, them, I want, I want to hold them there, and I want, I want them to enjoy the experience. I mean, one of the things, if you look at a lot of modern games, watch YouTube, watch the, the, the Gamer Rage YouTube things, they're quite funny, people getting upset and smashing their headsets and smashing their keyboards over in their face. And I don't want my games to ever make people feel like that. I want people to come off playing my game, even if you don't get your high score, even if at the end of the day it says game over. I want you to come up with a smile on your face because you've enjoyed the journey. And everything I do now, I want people to feel like that. And I'm very pleased to hear that a lot of people feel that way with Polybius. Well, Polybius is, at the end of it, it's like, oh, one more go, come on. And before you know, you've been on for about six hours. <laughs> yeah, and I, just, I just find it very, very chilling. And, and I, sometimes in the morning when I was working on Polybius, I could wake up and I could maybe, if I'd been on the beers the night before, be a little bit hungover, not really feel ready for work, feel a bit groggy. And then five minutes in there, and you come out sort of bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and like, hey, I feel great now. Well, Attack of the Mutant Camels and Revenge of the Mutant Camels were two of your biggest games in the 80s. What inspired those, and where did those ideas come from? Uh, well, I mean, Attack of the Mutant Camels, the inspiration for that was, uh, but it's basically the uh, Empire Strikes Back game by Parker Brothers on the VCS, which I played in the computer shop in Winchester. And I quite liked it, but I hadn't thought particularly that I was going to do a version of it. The reason that came around was because Computer and Video Games did a, a review of, of the Parker Brothers game. And they described the walkers as being giant mechanical camels. And as I told you, I have a big thing for camels from going back to my school days. And I thought, ooh, well, actually, why not do it with giant camels? That sounds great. And so I did that, that, that was my first game on the Commodore 64, I did that with the giant camels that looked like two fat men in a camel suit and the sprite wasn't particularly great and on the power version the camel's bums would occasionally drop off. Um, but having done that, I mean I like camels and this, in, in attacking the camels, the camels were the enemy. So I decided to do a sequel game where I invented this convoluted backstory where the camels were in fact had been abducted from Earth by the Zyaxians and brainwashed and you know, with the strength of a herd of 10,000 mutant metagoats on back on planet Earth who managed to reprogram the camels and get them to, to rebel against their oppressors so then the camels could be the heroes. Uh, so yeah, that arose from there really. Well, you also worked on the Connex multi-system, I did Yeah, what, what's the story there? Um, well, I mean, the uh, Connex were touting this thing around as being like, the, 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 an interesting new console to work on. Uh, it sounded interesting. I thought, I, I, at that point, I don't have ever worked on a console before. I thought I'd quite like to go have a go at working on the console. Uh, the display at the time was, was more advanced than what I was used to. It had 256 cars, which was a complete luxury back then. And um, you had to buy into it though. I remember I spent about 4,000 4, quid on a dev kit and tools and bits and pieces and a PC to run them on. Um, and got going on it, and it wasn't a bad system, and I got, I got a game about 70% completed on it. And then we were supposed to be going to this show in London where Connex was supposed to show up, it was getting close to the system's launch, and we were, all of us developers who were working on games were going to be able to demonstrate our stuff on our stand, and we got to the show, and nobody was there. <laughs> it's like, Oh dear. <laughs> and that so was in the end of that. Well, they got really close, didn't they, to releasing it? They were really like TV adverts and stuff I remember seeing. Yeah, I mean, it, it, so this was supposed to be the pre launch show, basically, where everybody was, got, was going to get to show off what, what they had for launch, and it, there was just nobody there. What was the system like to work on, though? I mean, was it very technically advanced at the time? 
It was, yeah, it was um, an 1886, if I recall. I think later versions they tried to upgrade it to an 1886, but the one I was on was 1886. And it had a blitzer that could do line draw and move chunks around reasonably quickly. It had this chunky load display that was quite nice. It had a DSP type sound chip, so basically you had to write your own sound chip on the DSP, but that was quite interesting to see. I'd never done anything like that before either, so I that, was, that was fun. Um, it could have done with being a bit faster perhaps, but for the stuff I was doing, I'm sure given time I could have made it you know, reasonably fast. It was, I was about 70% there, as I say. Actually, what, what was the game then you were working on? Uh, it was Attack of the Mutant Camels 89. <laughs> And it was nice, I, I had a friend of mine, um, an artist friend of mine, did these nice, you know, much nicer camels more than my two fat men in a camel suit. And um, I didn't know if you could do lovely, uh, you know, uh, rustic horizons and stuff. They looked pretty good. Actually, you can still play the game now. I thought it was lost and gone forever. But um, uh, one of the guys working on the, an emulator for the Codex actually found an old disc, a demo disc, which must have been sent to the it's, it's not the, the latest version of the game, it's about version 0.4. But you can actually play it. And one of the nice things in it as well, which is something I would like quite like to return to one day, I was ex experimenting with fractal music. And so you had these fractal tunes that were played all the time as you were playing. And like it would play, it would, it would make, um, it would play a major key while you were doing well, and then when you crashed it would play a minor key for a little while. It was fun, and I would quite like to do, to do that kind of stuff again. Well, you uh, have a strong relationship with Atari, and you work with the Jaguar as well, so w what did you think of that system? The Jaguar was actually pretty cool. I know it, it, it gets the piss taken out of it because of the whole 64-bit thing. Um, but in truth, some parts of it were 64-bit. Some parts of it were 16-bit, I and mean, it had 68K in, obviously. Some parts were 32-bit. Tom and Jerry, the custom chips, were effectively 32-bit wrist chips. But parts of the video hardware were actually programmed in 64-bit you know, there was 64-bit uh, um, um, architecture. So, yes, in, in truth, it was a hybrid of all these things, but marketing being marketing, just banged on 64-bit, 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 and it was all too easy to, to take the piss out of that, and in the end, it did deserve the piss taken out of it for that. But, I mean, that's the difference between, like, marketing and, and hardware designers and programmers, we don't do things like that, and they do. <laughs> I guess the architecture as well was quite different for the time, wasn't it? A lot of people couldn't get their head around it. Yeah, I mean, it was actually pretty nice. I mean, you had an object list processor, which was great for doing sprite-based stuff, but all the real cleverness was in the bitter, which, again, could do line draw, but, and you could do polygon draw, you could actually do garage shaded polygon draw, which was a big deal back then, nothing was really doing that. But it was quite complicated, because you, you couldn't just, like, set up a triangle and say, like, draw a triangle. You actually had to walk down the sides of the triangle using the, the uh, uh, tom chip to calculate the offset and, and set up that way. Um, so, yeah, it was, I mean, when I first started doing Tempest 2000, I thought at first I'd do it all in, in vector, because I didn't really know how to do polygons using, using, using the chip. But um, when I said that to my producer, said, yeah, that's all very good, but we want it to look nicer, so make it solid. And at first I resisted that, uh, but then I actually knuckled under and, and taught myself how to actually do that. And when it started to go solid, I, I agreed with it, and it did look much better. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a tale to tell behind that. When the, um, the Jaguar launch party happened in New York, um, I, w I was invited out there to the launch party, which was very nice of them. And, um, it was quite a nice sort of do and quite boozy towards the end. Uh, and, uh, I bumped into John Matheson, one of the, the, the chief system architects of the Jaguar, and I was talking to him. And he gave me a right dressing down. He told me that he'd seen Tempest 2000. He thought it was crap. He, <laughs> he said, "He said it's not really a major title for Atari. It's only a make weight title." And he thought, "I hadn't exercised any of the Jaguar at all, really, to make it." And um, of course, later on, he had to meet his work. <coughs> but now that's often regarded as like the best game on the system, isn't it? Uh, yeah, well, I, 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 I might say that ADP is probably a better game, but. Um, yeah, it's, it, it, it did well on the system, and anyway, me and John became friends after that. <laughs> so, <laughs> the soundtrack that they came out on CD, didn't they? It's an album release. Yeah, I mean, the soundtrack was, was amazing. I mean, the soundtrack actually blew me away, because, um, I mean, for ages I, I, I didn't have any music while I was working on it, and then when well, I got in touch with the audio guys, and they said, you know, what kind of tunes do you want? I basically made a, just a, a, a tape of the tunes I was listening to while I was developing it, and 
certain bands and make some of us kind of like this. And then you know, a few weeks passed and they sent me down a tape and said, well, here's a tape what we've got so far. We need another week or so to finish off the player so you don't have to put it in the Jaguar, but here's the music. And I played this tape. And it was, oh, well, uh, I had to ring them up and said, look, you sent me this tape. Is this really what it's going to sound like on the Jaguar or is this it coming off a bunch of synths? And they said, no, 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 this is really what it's going to sound like on the Jaguar. Sure enough, a couple of weeks later, they sent me, sent me down the drivers and everything. I plugged it into the bed and it, I was like, this is awesome. This is going to be brilliant. Because over the Tempest 2000, the music is half the game, it really is. And I was just so, so impressed with Magitek and what they did with that, with that, with that audio. It's fantastic stuff. But you also did Defender 2000 as well, didn't you? So yeah, yeah. What, what did you want to improve over the original with that game? Well, I mean, with Defender 2000, uh, it didn't really go in the way I wanted it to go. Um, I wanted to keep the graphics small. I wanted to do a lot of, you know, a lot of Eugene style explosions, which I think I think they deserve, being it was Eugene's game. Um, but by that stage, I was actually living in America and I was an employee of Atari. And they wanted at first the game to be on CD ROM. And they wanted all these like hand drawn sprite parallax layers and big ships and exactly the kind of stuff that you don't want in Defender. And so it ended up being much bigger and chunkier and, and less psychedelic than I wanted it to be. Um, so yeah, it didn't really go in the direction that oh well, yeah, I'm still I'm happy enough with it, but it's not such a good game as Tempest 2000. Yeah. I'm already playing classic mode if I'm playing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Classic mode. There's a classic mode and there's a little psychedelic mode that I started work. That was more or less the direction I started to go in before they shoved me off that. So that little psychedelic mode is kind of the start of the direction I was going to go. Uh, the big spritey, scrolly thing was that's all them making a mistake, in my opinion. Oh, a theme that I kind of find in your games as well is precision, so like with the mobile phone games as well. And uh, I remember with Tempest on the new one, you had a, a wheel controller at one of the shows. Um, did you have any custom Tempest controllers made up at all? Um, there's been nothing commercial. I mean, when, when we first did Tempest 2000 at Atari, there was no actual concrete plan to make a controller, but they wanted me to build in the possibility just in case they ever did. So one of the last things I did while I was at Final Test, I get, they gave me uh, like a VCS driving controller thing. And basically I made it so that it would, re it would respond to one of those. And if in the future somebody wanted to make a spinny controller, the hooks were in there. There was a, a secret code you could use to unlock this thing. The hooks were in there. Um, for later versions, like the TXK and Tempest 4000, when Giles has actually made a custom controller which has got a better spin than the original coin up, it's really, really, really good. And um, I keep I keep wanting one of these days to do a video to show people how to make this control. It's all made from one standard components, it's pretty easy to put together. And it's quite a unique way of playing as well. Yeah, I mean Tempest, I mean that's the way you're supposed to play Tempest really, that's the way the corner was designed, that's what Dave Toyer intended, and so it's nice to be able to actually provide the opportunity to play it that way. Well I have, you know, one of the rare working Atari Jaguar CDs. Ah yes. Uh, not many of them around these days. Yeah. But you did the virtual light machine for that as well, so how did you get that job and what was the idea there? Um, well, I'd, I'd, I'd hooked up with a couple of guys from Inmos, the, oh, the transputer people, they'd seen some of the, the lights that work I'd done on the ST. Stuff like Color Space and Trippertron. And um, we got together and we, we formed this entity called the Virtual Light Company. And we, we, we made a transputer based um, interactive um, audio driven light synthesizer, which was never commercially sold, but which was deployed at raves. And I think like, Prince even used it once, and Shane even used it once in, in, in one of their shows. Um, and so we've been working on that. At the same time, I've been doing work on Tempest 2000. Um, one of the techniques I, I kind of stumbled across on the Jaguar in Tempest 2000 was the whole thing of video feedback. And I got that going, and that was another case of I'm losing the day or so, just fiddling with the controls, going, whoa, this is fantastic. <laughs> Can I use that somehow? And so I showed this to the virtual light guys, and we decided to approach Atari. We knew they were doing the CD ROM. We decided to approach Atari to go and see, you know, see if they'd be interested in us making something to actually build into the CD ROM unit, which would do this stuff when you play the CD. So we, we hopped on a plane and went out to go and petition, petition to, to Jack in person. And, and Mr. Trummel said yes. Like, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that was, that was fun. It was nice doing that. Do you think the Jaguar should have got a lot more life and kind of appreciation? 
Um, yeah, I, it would have been nice. So it would be nice if Atari had been willing to to pay some people. You know, they should have paid more people like me, really, to come and take their their, their classic IP. Uh, they they should still be doing that to this day, to be honest with you. Um, but they just weren't prepared to they weren't prepared to pay very much. I mean, they got Tempest for uh, Tempest 2000 for next to nothing. I mean, really, they got it very, very, very cheaply. Um, and they weren't prepared to to pay people. They expected people to flock to their system. And they weren't prepared to pay people to actually exploit the IP they had. If they'd had like fantastic versions of, you know, of Asteroids 2000 and Star Raiders 2000 and Missile Command 2000 and you know, Centipede 2000 and all the stuff they could have done and should have done and had ready for launch, then I think they would have had a chance to capture that generation who had grown up with the VCS and maybe the Ape and Atari, um, maybe were still in the market to buy a console. If they could have got a, a toehold there, then maybe the Jaguar might have prevailed. Maybe it might have stood a chance. Maybe get, given the 18 months or so it had before the PlayStation came out, maybe it might have had a chance to, to get a toe hold. But I, Atari, just throughout history, just don't seem to know what they're doing half the time. Yeah. Even more so to this day. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people kind of just half fast and did, just used a 68K, didn't they? And yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I suppose they did. I mean, but I mean, to me, half the fun when you're developing something is, is getting into the nitty gritty of the hardware and trying to get the most out of it. But in this day and age, it must be said, and probably started with the PlayStation because they had such a, a, an excellent development environment that you could write everything in C, you had libraries to do everything, you had hardware that backed it up really well, and you didn't have to do this dancing on the metal that us old school people used to do. Um, in a way, that, that does make sense, but I can't miss the, the old school stuff. But yes, to get the best out of the Jaguar, you needed to be a bit old school. But well, we also did, um, again, the, many people probably haven't played because so it was quite an obscure platform, uh, Tempest 3000. That came, and you all know what the, the new one is? Got you got one, Paul. <laughs> 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 well, what was the new one for people that might not know? And tell us about Tempest 3000. Well, I mean, the new one was, um, was founded by a bunch of guys who, who spun off from Atari when Atari went tits up in 1996. And uh, no, I got invited to join them in this company called VM Labs. And the idea was that they would make uh, a, a DVD decoder chip. Because at, at that time, DVD was just about to come out, and there were various decoder solutions. They were hardwired decoders that basically DVD decode nothing else. And the idea for VM Labs is that they would make uh, a general purpose processor, or well, it basically was a, a small array of processors, which could do DVD decoding software, and as a result could then be generally programmable to do other stuff like games, or you know, uh, they also wanted to do like enhanced DVD effects and movie effects and things like that. And so they produced this thing. It was it actually the the, the, the new chip itself was a minor miracle. It really was. It was a single 54 megahertz chip, and. With that chip, with no hardware acceleration, I was able to make a game where I was calculating every single pixel in the same way that you do now with shaders, and make a game that could still run at an acceptable, well, mostly acceptable, most of the time, some of the time not, but still at a, yeah, a reasonable frame rate. Purely in software, in a 54 megahertz chip, the downside to that was you had, in order to do that, you had to, pro, you had to basically you had to parallel program your your, your, your application, split it over these four CPUs. Each CPU only has like 4K of instruction RAM and 4K of data RAM. So you had to break your, your screen up into chunks. You had to DMA a bit of code into the instruction area. You had to DMA a chunk of, uh, of screen memory into the, into the data area. Then you had to work on it, and then you had to DMA it all out. And because there was only 4K of instruction RAM, you had to then have code over this on top of this. Plus, as well as that parallelism, you had a fine-grained parallelism where you had, if you had to program it in assembler, um, you could con construct instruction packets <coughs> of up to seven sub-instructions per instruction packet. And this, for an assembly programming nerd like me, this was kind of nerd nirvana. This was probably the peak of my assembly programming career. I absolutely loved doing this stuff. It was so satisfying, but it was also really, really quite difficult to do. And I think there were probably only about sort of like five or six people in the world who could actually program the neuron and, and, and get the most out of it. And that was one of the major problems with it. 
you, the, the, there was one one of these processor units which which, which, which had a, a cache which enabled you to program it in C, and you could use sort of general purpose libraries which which um, we made, but it was nowhere near as good. Uh, yeah, you could do kind of like Philips CDI level stuff, but you couldn't really do like Tempest 3000 level stuff. So only a few games got made. Most of the games that were made were made in this really simple mode, and only really Tempest was. The only one which really was, was made to exploit the full power of the system. It was just too hard for most people to program. I don't mean to I mean, I just in terms of time, it took time to do it. I loved it, but it, it, it was not to be. Oh, by the way, the, the assembler on that system, the, the code name for the chip we were developing was Merlin. So the assembler was called uh, Low Level Assembler for Merlin Architecture. So I don't know if you can work out the accurate of that. And, um, and th there was another layer of assembler which was supposed to go above that, which did the instruction packing I was talking about for you, so it was slightly abstracted, and that was called abstract level packing assembler. Um. <laughs> well, the idea behind the new one was pretty good, though. I mean, it was kind of like what 3DO tried to do a decade before, really, that it would be a standardised platform where everyone would have a game system built into their DVD player. Um, the idea probably could have took off if um, it was easier to program, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it was a combination of, uh, of it being different to program, and also it was, we were about a year late to market, really. By the time we got the bugs and the chip out, um, there were other solutions available at that point which were uh, yeah, uh, uh, cheaper than we were. And so, although we did get into like, Toshiba and a couple of other players, it never really took off, unfortunately, and that was the end of their match. Well, you went to uh, work on the virtual light machine on the Xbox 360. Working with Microsoft, how was that? Um, yeah, that that was that came that was rather a surprise as well. I, I found out at some point that Jay Allard, uh, the guy at, at Microsoft who was behind the Xbox in those days, had actually been a fan of some of the licensing stuff I'd done for years, and had originally tried to contact me. An email must have gone missing or something because I don't remember ever seeing an email from him. Apparently, he tried to contact me to do like some kind of psychedelic sequence for the boot up sequence of the original Xbox. Um, but obviously I didn't get to do that, but then I think I heard through, through Gary Lydon or something like that that they, were interested in, they might be interested in doing um, a light synth um, for the upcoming Xbox 360. And so we put together a demo and went out and showed that to them, uh, the stuff we could do at the time. Because I've been working on stuff on the, on the um, GameCube. And I had what was effectively a light synth that was designed to do texture generation for a game I was working on for that. And so I adapted that and showed them that, and um, yeah, they said, do the visualizer for the Xbox 360. I thought, yeah, I'll do this. I tried to get a royalty off them. No, no way, you're not getting, you're not even one P per Xbox, you're not getting that. You're going to get a flat fee and that's it. It's Microsoft haven't got much money, have they? <laughs> yeah, I but I mean, that, that's probably the most widely distributed bit of Microsoft software ever. So I couldn't complain. I mean, it was good fun to do, and it was, it was a nice light and it came out pretty well. We were talking before we started doing the panel, but you know, I'm a big fan of Polybius, the game that you made recently. Um, what was, because I mean, that was an urban legend, Polybius, originally, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. <laughs> what was the story there, then, with using that iconic name and the background of Polybius? Well, I mean, having done TXK and uh, got into hot water with Atari, I thought, well, if I base this on an urban legend, no one's going to be able to actually know me for it, because it's an urban legend. So, as far as I, also, other people have done like, their own variations of Polybius, I think it was free for all. But it wasn't, it wasn't anything anybody could see me over, so I thought, yeah, well, why not? And also, I thought it would be quite interesting to imagine the game, especially as I was doing a VR game, you know, to imagine a game that was kind of psychoactive in the way, well, not necessarily in the way that Polybius was supposed to be psychoactive, because Polybius, the arcade game, was supposed to be deleteriously psychoactive. I wanted something that could be psychoactive in the opposite direction, that could actually make you feel better rather than make you feel brainwashed and worse. Well, Polybius, I mean, wasn't it like a, a system that apparently the FBI or something put in a, an arcade to brainwash kids or something? Yeah, I mean, the legend was it appeared in some arcade, I can't remember where it was, now, in Pittsburgh or something like that, wasn't it? And uh, the kids would get addicted to it, and the men in black would come and check the stats on the machine, and the kids would start to have bad experiences, and uh, um, they'd start to feel sick and upset and things like that, and then, then it disappeared completely. And uh, over the years, I think I first heard about it when I was still living in the US and on the arcade news groups, people would say, I've got a wrong image of Polybius. And of course, you download it and it wouldn't work in mainly anyway, of course, because it doesn't exist. But, uh, 
So there's this legend that you go around for so long. I thought, yeah, well, why don't I have my own fun with the legend? It's, yeah, and that's what it was. Do you believe the legend? Uh, I think it's an urban legend, basically. I don't think that it was actually <coughs> existed, but it, 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 it's, a, it's a nice story. I mean, when, I, when I released, or well, just before I released Rivers, I made up this, uh, a story which I put on the, on the, the Sony website about how I do the Bayesian slope, and somebody had shown me in a shady sort of a warehouse. <laughs> they had, a, they had a, this machine under a sheet that was revealed to me as being this fantastic Bolivius, and I started to play, and then I blacked out, and then I didn't remember anything until afterwards, and then, and then the game which I'm making now is the fragmentary memories coming back, and I'm just reinterpreting them, and that's my Bolivius. Well, Tempest 4000 is out now, so uh, what can we expect from that game? Uh, you could expect basically TXK enhanced. Um, I mean, TXK itself started as me wanting to effectively do an updated, definitive version of Tempest 2000. Because oh, when Tempest 2000 is nice, but when I look back at it now, I can see the frame rate gets choppy, and of course it's done on a fairly low resolution raster without any real alpha effects, so you don't get a nice effect to glow. And I thought it would be lovely to do. A modern update, 60 frames a second, really nice looking vectors, lots and lots of particle systems and stuff like that. And so that's what TXK was. And then of course there was all that malarkey. And uh, then we actually managed to, to deal with Atari and do an updated version that was even closer to Tempest uh, 2000 than TXK was. But no, you could expect a nice smooth Tempest game, lots of levels, lots of music. You've got the original Tempest 2000 soundtrack, you've got the CD version of Tempest 2000 soundtrack. And you've got the TXK soundtrack. Um, you can expect no drop frames. You can expect the frame rate to be absolutely lovely because drop frames are sin against God. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you like Tempest, then hopefully you'll enjoy it. You also expect weird release practices from Atari. I don't know why you can't get a physical copy in the UK. People ask about it all the time. I have no idea. Atari are just Atari being a thing to themselves, as they always will be. Um, but hopefully you'll enjoy it. Well, uh, before we go to questions from the audience, I'll just ask uh, what you're working on now. Um, well, we're working on basically finishing off Monitor Arcade Volume 1. We'll say, if you can come and play it now, you see the games are complete. But we have turned up a few bugs. Uh, just coming here has been a great bug test, actually, because lots of people play, you get, people, you get to see a lot of edge cases. I've managed to break it myself a couple of times, so we'll go ahead and fix those. But hopefully, we should have the Steam version of that out within about a month and the PS4 version now, probably a month or two later, because PS4 always takes longer because we've got to go through CERT. Uh, meanwhile, Giles is also hard at work on the uh, uh, PC port of Polybius. So that, that will also be out hopefully soon. And beyond that, I mean, I'm going to see how Monitor Arcade Volume 1 goes. If that goes well, then maybe I'll do Monitor Arcade Volume 2. And if not, then maybe I'll think about doing something else. So we'll see how it goes. Excellent. Well, we'll give you guys a chance to ask some questions to Jeff. Just put your hand up if you've got a question. Thank you. What a fun talk, always is. Um, first, uh, one thing that made me laugh with your talk is that you mentioned that CompuNet they used to switch it off at two in the morning. <laughs> I say they ought to do that for the internet. The world <laughs> would be a better. I get to bed now, lads, it's two o'clock. You know? um, and while you talk about the uh, revisiting Commodore 64 games, and Cipicles a good call, it's cheap in space, all right? Oh, that, 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 actually, cheap in space would be handled pretty well by, by the environment. There's some stuff the environment does which would be ideal for well, that's a promise, so I'll pause with that. Uh, okay, I've got um, uh, uh, two questions. Uh, the first is your games, and I'm going right back as well. Uh, well, people often use words like, oh, they're surreal. They're actually really British. There's loads of Britishness in your games. I've just been playing Grid Runner, and you know, one of the levels named Check Cameron uh, and Corbin, and you often use little British phrases and use British farm animals. My question over the years, I've got two questions, is that um, I wondered if you'd ever had any interesting feedback from people around the world who just don't get it, and I, and I wonder if you'd ever had any pressure to like, you need to un-British this because some people don't get it. And the second one, you've clearly got some gaming heroes. You might be a gaming hero to some people in this room, but you've got your own gaming heroes, particularly Eugene Jarvis and Dave Toyer. They say you should never meet your heroes. Have you ever met your heroes, and how did it go? Um, well, I mean, I'm, I am as British as a cup of tea, so that does tend to, to creep into what I do. I have, I've seen reviews of my stuff in the US where they will mention the British humour, where perhaps they don't get it, but I mean, the only case where I've been egregiously forced to un-British stuff was actually working, for, working at Atari. 
where every mention of colour, I had to take the bloody U out. Oh, it, made me, made me, it made me cross. I was not happy. Um, as regards uh, Toira and, and, and Jarvis, I've never met Dave Toira. Uh, he pretty much keeps himself to himself these days. Um, I, I know that, that uh, apparently he doesn't hate me, which I think is a, a, a reasonable result. Um, I have met Eugene. And Eugene is an absolute gentleman, an absolutely lovely bloke. Uh, it turned out there was a, a, a guy who was a fan of Lama's off in the early days. Uh, ended up working at Williams, a um, guy called Jake Simpson. And um, I, I was going to a, a, a show in Chicago, and Jake had a word with Eugene and told him that I was a, a big fan. And Eugene uh, took the time to come out, uh, he spent a, a whole afternoon hanging out with me. Uh, bought me beers, I got pictures of him somewhere playing Tempest 2000. It was a, you know, a wonderful afternoon chatting with him. He got me in to see his latest project, which he was also being um, displayed behind closed doors there, uh, which was Cruising the USA. Um, but no, it, absolute gentleman, absolutely loved it. And um, there is a chance that I may get to meet him again uh, at the beginning of next year, so I'm looking forward to that. Any more questions? Yeah, where did the idea come from to uh, mix psychedelic graphics with games? Um, well, I've, been, I've been working with the license stuff for ages. I mean, I first started with the whole thing of I wanted to do something that was a bit different than games, and I started doing this thing called Psychedelia back in 1984, where I was just exploring the idea of, of generating sort of, um, you know, symmetric, vis symmetric flow and visuals uh, to be. The idea was that you would actually use the joystick to do this stuff yourself while listening to your favourite music, Pink Floyd. Um, and so I've done various iterations of that. And so when I was working on Tempest 2000, it just all, it seemed to fit in somehow. As I said, I came up with this, this visual feedback technique using a jagged of glitter. And um, once I saw that, it kind of linked into all the stuff that I'd be doing with the with the, 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 the what I used to call light synthesizers. And then when the music came in, and it all sort of fit together so well, that, that whole kind of style just evolved down. And Tempest 2000 was really the start point to it. Um, but it was just a combination of these things coming together at the right time. But having done Tempest 2000, I, I then had a Bit of a beer in my body about always wanting to bring together these two sides, the light synth side and the game side, and work them into this sort of wonderful abstract psychedelic mishmash. <laughs> Any more questions? Just put your hand up. Oh, hello, uh, just wanted to ask when you said you turned up to the uh Conics launch party. Did it? Was there physically just no one there? Um, basically, there was there was a stand set up at this computer show where Conics was supposed to be, and there was just no equipment on it and no people there. And it was like, what's going on? <laughs> Thought you were going to be here. I mean, was there with their own stand, so it wasn't like we just showed up and had nowhere to go. We were actually there, but the the, the idea was that the developers who had been working on Conics games would be showing off their, their works on Conics' own stand. So I went, I went to where they were supposed to be, thinking to see uh, where they put uh, Attack of the Mutant Camels. And not only was Attack of the Mutant Camels not there, nothing was there. Got one down the front here. You've done stuff on handheld consoles, on the Vita, and you've done stuff on TV consoles. Have you thought about doing anything on the Nintendo Switch? Um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't mind doing stuff on the Switch. It's, it's certainly a lovely, capable little platform. I think some of the stuff we've done would look really, really nice on there. It's a question of, of finding sort of uh, uh, financial and temporal space in which to do that. At the moment, I mean, the Switch is so popular that I, my main fear in going into it would be like we'd put some stuff on there and go into a massive scrolling list of everything else on there and be utterly, utterly lost. Uh, but then, yeah, that, that, that is the problem with just about every platform these days. But yeah, I mean, certainly we're considering it. Giles has already been thinking about how we go about porting the engine to it. So I, I wouldn't rule it out. If we get the chance, we'll, we'll, we'll probably do something on that. Lots of fun, the Switch as well. It's kind of pick up and play game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I really like the Switch. I, I think it's a lovely system. But, 
yeah, hopefully we'll get to do stuff. Well, I'm personally, just in terms of, 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 of the game designer implementing a game, I would love to do it because I think it would look nice. Uh, there you go. And, um, as an Amiga user, you've mentioned Atari several times in your discussion of Twitch Twitch time. Um, <laughs> what's the company Atari like now from when you first met them? How has it, how has it evolved or changed? Uh, it's, it's not the same company, basically. I mean, it's not the same people. There's no real continuity between the Atari that I knew and the Atari that exists now. I mean, the Atari that exists now basically used to be Infograms, didn't they? Um, they bought the rights to all the Atari titles, and as far as I know, the people at Atari aren't actually developing anything. They're just like farming out this IP to various people. Um, I mean, even the Atari I knew wasn't the original, original Atari. Because I knew Tremiel Atari, which of course is different from um, Bushnell Atari, but there were still some people who had been there since the Bushnell days, so there was a degree of continuity. This new Atari, there's not really any continuity between that and, and where I was. I mean, it's, it's a different company, it owns the name Atari, but it's not really the same entity. What are the Tremiels like to deal with? Um, I actually got on really well with them. I know they've got, I, I, obviously they have got sharp business practices because I mean, some of the stuff that happened to me with Tempest was really sharp. Um, for example, uh, I, I, I never knew why Tempest, why, why Tempest X3 was called Tempest X3 and why they changed the gameplay in, 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 in ways which I thought were a bit, a bit dubious. I found out years later talking to, I, I had a chat with the programmer online, he said he'd been instructed to make it very slightly different than Tempest 2000 in order to ease the royalty burden. <laughs> in other words, to cut me out of, the, uh, of the, any royalties which might have arisen from a PlayStation version. Now, somebody at the time must have made that decision, so it probably went up to some of the Tremels. But some of the individual Tremels I got well with, I mean, uh, in particular Leonard. Leonard was a huge fan of, uh, of the licensing stuff. Uh, when I was at Atari working on the, on the Jaguar VLM, I would sometimes come into the office in the morning and find Leonard playing some music on my CD-ROM and literally dancing around and really, really enjoying it. Um, so yeah, I got on well with Leonard. Um, um, even Jack sort of you know, was, was okay. I, I, my, I think my best Jack moment was uh, I was invited out to Atari to work on the uh, prototype Jaguar. And uh, they flew me out there and it ended up in this lock room with the prototype hardware and they threw the manuals at me and said, you know, do something. And so I, I, I'll try and learn my way around and see what I come up with a few little demos and I did some demos. And uh, at one point Jack Jamal came by and I had this demo of some pictures and they were walking and moving around and stuff. And, uh, and Jack turned around and said, that's the best thing I've seen on the, on the Jaguar so far. And I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, if people want to play mine at all, um, you're in the trading area? Yeah, you're in the trading area. Just pop around and see us. You can play it either way out of VR. Do you come and have a go? Great. Well, please give a big thank you to Jeff Mitter.